The first time I was arrested, I was 19 years old. 26 at the time. I was 17. 16 years old. 19 years old. I just turned 16 years old. Well, I was 17 when I was arrested. My arrest seemed like it was yesterday. Like it was yesterday. We had a family gathering at the house. I was getting ready to take a friend to doctor's appointment. Um, maybe about three or four of my cousins and my brother, we were all standing in front of our home. Out on the corner. I was in bed. They had just gotten out the shower. Two or more calls passed. One stopped, one kept going. When that stopped, he hopped out of the car. He come to the house. And I heard him banging on the door. door. It didn't sound like a neighbor knocked. My mother answered the door, and they just barged their way they in. They had their hand near their firearm. Draw the guns, asked me to get up. They twist my arms, put the cuffs on me. I had on nothing but my underwear. Everybody that was on the corner at that time was arrested. I'm asking them, why am I being arrested? They told me they couldn't tell me any of that. I had to come with them. I remember a lot of people outside watching me get into the car, watching everybody pass by, and in your mind you're thinking if you're ever going to see these people. When we make it there to Central Lockup, they're getting me out the car, I'm handcuffed, I'm looking around like, what is this place? What's going on here? I just remember going down the corridor, going into the precinct, where they have all these people being detained. First thing they ask you to do is take everything out of your pockets, tag it, bag it. You know, they pressed my finger on everything. They took my mug shot, told me to stand up. Like I'm posing for a picture and, and turn sideways. And then put you in a holding cell. When they shut that door behind me, I stopped and I just looked. 90% of the people that are in here, they all gonna stop doing what they're doing and look at you. All these different faces, everybody in there for different reasons. Different vibes running through that cage in there. They got frustration, constant moving. It's a small jungle that you be trapped inside of. You have a big pot of gumbo in one cell, and it's all different flavors. It feels like you're drowning. They came through with some cold sandwiches. Cold bologna sandwich, too. The meat was frozen. I didn't have an appetite to eat. So I just used my sandwich for a pillow. Then they call three people out every few hours and be booked. Then they take you, cattle you down, line you up against the wall. A few deputies stand on the opposite side. And they make everybody at once take off their clothes. You have to bend over, touch your ankles with one hand. Use your other hand to open your butt cheeks. You have to cough, and then sometime when they really want to dehumanize you, cough harder. <laughs> they ask you your size jumper, and they give you an orange jumper with some slippers and, you know, towels. So if you pick the wrong jumper, you stuck with it. If it's too small, you stuck with it. If it's too big, you stuck with it. They moved me upstairs, third floor, to an area in HOD. CCC, they put me in the back. I want to say it was three cells down there. The bed was uncomfortable. The pillow was uncomfortable. I couldn't sleep. I would take my fingers and try and hold my eyes open to keep from falling asleep. But eventually, the body wears down, it, and we have no control over it. up at about 4 30 5 o'clock rack the cells this time he walks up to the cell and he's gonna call names your name is called Edward Johnson Isaac Knapper Jerome Morgan uh, Jew bro told I had a court date that actually you want to take a shower I had more confusion terror and anxiety than the drops that fell out the shower here in over three minutes Then they bring you a line up, through some waist chains, shackles, and handcuffs at your feet. They take one of your legs and they attach them to another person's leg. The guard would be holding the front chain like we animals, and he would pull us. We follow him.
They put so many people in the bus, I did not have a seat. I was forced to sit in the aisle. They held us on the bus for hours and hours and hours waiting to go to court. I'm locked inside of a box, inside of a box with shackles on my feet. The courthouse was on the other side of the street. So it took from 5 o'clock in the morning to maybe 8 o'clock just to get 20 feet on a bus. Taken into a back door, into a tunnel, and then you come out what they call a docks. Nowhere to sit, no benches, no mattresses, nothing. And we would sit in that cell until our name is being called to go and face the judge. You listen for the name when they call it in a lineup, because they're not going to call it again. So if you miss your name, you miss your court. They bring you out to the auction block 12 at a time. First, in the back, when the room that looked like this, nothing but concrete floors, and walls, and ceilings. As soon as they open the door and I come out, I see nothing but cherry wood, like polished things. I see people, families who sitting in the front row. My family just didn't come. Order in court, all rise. Section M1 of the Criminal District Court is now in session. The Honorable Judge is now presiding. Silence is commanded under penalty of fine or imprisonment. God save this honorable court. Please be seated. Good morning, Your Honor. Everyone who is arrested and whose cases go to criminal court starts out going through magistrate court and has what's called a first appearance. You will see to your left at the door is a deputy sheriff, armed, and then you'll see to your right the clerks working for the court. Then there's two tables. The first one is the district attorney, and then further back is the public defenders. When I come into court, I usually get there before the judge takes the bench. Go to my table, and I gather my files and folders. Maybe reviewing the gist. There are some people in the audience you know, waiting for their case to be called. And then you know that the people are coming. It's because it sounds like a slave ship or like the sounds of ghosts in the attic because you hear all of this crazy jangling. That's when you see a person at their most broken state. You've already left the anxiety of the jail and now you're facing a courtroom. Everybody comes in, then the judge comes out. When I enter, they, you know, they do the all rise. Order in court, all rise. And I sit down and I usually say good morning, everyone. The magistrate judge would just go through each case and do a first appearance and the judge generally would ask the DA what the charge is and if they had any information on the person's prior record. And then you hear all these people talking about you. The lawyers, they referencing your name, you keep hearing the judge reference your name, and then you go over to a booth and you speak to one of the lawyers. So I introduce myself, I tell them I'm with the public defender's office, tell them that I'm a lawyer. How did I even end up here? All the events that happened the day before, I never thought I would be here. Sometimes when people are really upset, you know, I just try to spend a minute calming them down. I don't have a lot of time to talk to people. The only thing they knew about me were the documents that they had in hand. I read the police report to them. What's alleged there? Sometimes they have no idea. When I realized sort of what the incident might have been about, I was like, you, you got to be kidding me. When they read all this to me is when I realized the police officer he saw them throw the crack pieces on the ground, right? But he didn't write the report that way. You will see the exact same police report Xeroxed, the same thing in terms of the person's possession of drugs. And that's it, there's probable cause. You're not allowed to present a defense. You can't go outside the four corners of the police report. They're to look at it as if every single thing that's alleged in writing is true. I don't believe that you question each and every police officer. You set a bond from there. Before you set a bond, you need to determine if the defendant has the ability to pay a bond. There's no thinking about it. I knew I couldn't pay it. And my people didn't have that kind of money. I said, this is your bond. They had so many zeros on it. I don't know what the f is. <laughs> I don't think that there is any rhyme or reason to the amount of bonds that are set. I had probably been in that back about four or five hours. And that process was probably 10 to 11 minutes and I was right back out. The crazy part is the judge never looked at me. My mind just uh, stopped working. 
you feel suffocated with, with, with voidness of being a human being. Have to resist by retreating within yourself until this whirlwind subside enough for you to feel safe to try to figure out what's going on. I don't know how to describe it like a, a bright black, you know, is a space where darkness is at peace. But outside where it's red, an island surrounded by a sea of blood bubbling. Red. Just red, red. Now I'm sick to my stomach. I have a really, really bad headache because now I can't be strong anymore. I'm crying the whole time I'm waiting on the docks to go back to the jail because reality has set in. I know that I'm going upstairs now. If you got the money, you know you're about to be out in the next 24 hours. But if you ain't got the money, you might be here the next six months to a year. Now i am got a bunch of what ifs. How do I live now being locked up? Because I'm asking tons of questions to the ladies that are on the docks with me. And um, one lady in particular, she said, well, don't worry about it. If they don't accept the charge, then you'll be out in 60 days. I remember the slamming of the door, the chinking of the chains as we walked down the halls. I remember the closing of the door of the school bus, getting back to the jail and getting in the cell and hearing the air come out the psh, and the slamming of the door. That's it. That's a wrap. Everything faded to black.